present day Rockport, Texas, maybe just a little bit north of that, because all the egrets and the ducks are going to fly south, and that's their food supply. In the springtime, when the trees leaf out, the prickly pear cactus blooms with the tuna, the fruit, then those bands would move north again. They didn't leave the river valley because all living things need water. And remember that Native Americans at this point in time, particularly in South Texas, are pedestrians. The Europeans bring the horse to the Americas. That, that great image, that great American iconic image isn't really American at all. The last thing that looked like a horse went extinct many tens of thousands of years before these natives uh, moved around what we call South Texas. So these, band, these natives move in bands, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Displayed on the screen are the typical kinds of what we would call arrowheads, but more realistically, more uh, accurately, we'd refer to them as dart points. They were still very much, even up to the early 1700s, very much still what would be considered a Stone Age culture because they're using stone tools, bone tools, wearing very little if nothing, um, because again, not trying to make a, a lifestyle change, but South Texas is hot. You're not really going to waste a lot of time on, uh, on fashion, really, in South Texas. Although, running around naked, I think this morning, you might would have hoped to have a nice deerskin blanket to wrap yourself in. But at least 10,000 years, these bands moved along the river. Um, a lot of artist renderings on what people would have looked like. The reality of it is, we don't have any idea. They move with the seasons, but we do know from archaeological sites that they tended to return season after season to around the same areas. And I think about growing up as a kid in South Texas, we would load up once a year to go to Garner State Park to camp. And my dad, being the creature of habit that he was, would, uh, would be angry if we didn't get the exact same spot, it was his favorite spot, like camping spot 212, the bend in the road, far enough away from the restrooms where you don't have to listen to people, but close enough where you can walk over there at night if you need to. You know, he had the perfect place uh, scouted out, and that's where we returned year after year. Well, these people did the same thing. They found the good high ground along the river that allowed them easy access, but still a little bit of protection from maybe other groups, or certainly knowing where the best hunting areas were, the best fishing areas. Who here has to, you know, the great fishermen in their family that has their, their secret spot that they go to year after year? Well, because they've had success there. So these natives would return similar campgrounds. How do we know this? Archaeologically, season after season, you find deposits of virtually the same kinds of dart points and leftover bone, one on top of the other for season after season, showing that, if not the exact same family, certain groups that use the, the land in a similar way return to those camping areas year after year. Um, one of the friars wrote early on that these natives were, quote, as naked as the day they were born. Cabeza de Vaca writes the same thing in his book, La Relacion, as he's shipwrecked in South Texas earlier, even than our mission period. And again, like I said, um, when Europeans began to sketch these people, they had that sense of modesty in their artwork where they didn't tend to draw, uh, let us say, overly graphic images, which led to this idea that these natives wore more than they probably actually did most of the time. Uh, so uh, people wanting to have PG pictures for their books gave us the wrong impression of how our natives may or may not have, uh, I'm using air quotes, dressed. Um, so they move along the river in bands, right? They're a band communities, not tribal. Um, this may sound like a picky point, but it's really not. When people say Native Americans, because of movies and TV shows and popular books, we tend to always want to say, what tribe was it? But a tribe is a government. There are levels, and tribe is really kind of just a couple of pecking orders below king. It has a very organized, stratified society with a leader and a religious leader and a military leader that spoke to subunits underneath that. The natives that were, lived in the San Antonio River Valley were large family units. They were not cohesive. They were not allied. Uh, they spoke dozens of different dialects and languages. Um, 
they could communicate more or less with one another, but the same way that every South Texan can say, you know, uno mas cerveza, por favor, right? You know, you may not know a lot of Spanish, but, you know, donde está el baño? You know how to get the things that you need. Uh, and these people would have done the same thing. Later on, that's confused by the Spaniards that assume they all speak the same language and are all the same person, but they absolutely weren't. Subsisted through hunting and gathering, no permanent dwellings. They're not teepee builders or wikiups or grass huts. They're sleeping in rock caves and shelters or very temporary hides thrown over low mesquite tree limbs to make kind of a temporary tent. Not one language, but many. Um, beginning in the early 20th century, scholars began to refer to these people as Quahueltecans or people of Coahuila. Well, that's not a, really accurate. The, the Coahuilteco was a language, one of the languages spoken, but a father-daughter team, Campbell and Campbell, of anthropologists did a phonetic study of the band names that people gave themselves as they entered the missions, and they recognized maybe 24 different languages being spoken. Last but not least, let me beleaguer one point about names. If you don't speak the same language that I do, and I ask you who you are, how are you answering that question? Como se llama? Well, if I don't understand what that means, my answer to you might be, huh? Oh, his name's H-U-H, -H, huh? You know, what's the, what's the communication level? Think back to those old Tarzan movies, you know, me, Tarzan, you, Jane. We don't know that they understood the question they were being asked. We don't know how they answered. Then it's spelled, then whatever janky answer they're given is being spelled phonetically by scarcely literate Spaniards. So all these years later, when we use these names as this absolute, this is who they were, really think about how we came to those names. It's, it's really kind of comical. I used to tell people a couple of years ago in, in, in professional basketball, there was the, the young man that played for the Houston Rockets and he was from China and his name was Yao Ming. Now, here in San Antonio, we loved our Spurs, right? And we'd see on the back of the jersey, Parker or Ginobili or Duncan. Well, on the back of Yao Ming's jersey was Yao. And I heard so many people say, how come he gets his first name on the jersey? Well, that's not his first name. And in Chinese and Mandarin and in Canton, the things are reversed. So names are a human construct. We have people that, oh, my name was this. And then when I got married, I changed my name to this. That's just all made up rules. So when it comes to who are these people, let's stick with the things we know, how they hunted, what they ate, with the areas that they moved. And when we go to things like names and beliefs, we have to understand we honestly really don't know very much about these people. Then comes the kingdom of Spain. There's always new guys in the neighborhood, right? This is uh, beginning early, late 1600s as those first expeditions moved through South Texas. But they won't begin to really settle South Texas, our area, till close to 1718. Meaning that I used to tell little kids this all the time. People will say, oh, that happened in prehistoric times. Well, remember, that's just before writing. So if someone tells you that's prehistoric times, you ask them, prehistoric times where? Because prehistoric times in Egypt go back thousands and thousands of years. Prehistoric times in Texas goes back 300 to when Spain first brought the first written language to this part of our world. And they come here because of this charming document. Let's all read it together. I'm kidding. We're not going to read this. It's the Treaty of Tordesillas signed in 1494. I will not bother you with a lot of world history, but understand this is the earliest version of Manifest Destiny there was. This is a document where Spain and Portugal basically divided the world in half. Now, Spain and Portugal, I didn't mention a lot of other countries there, eh, the Germanys and the Englands and the Frances of the world, not invited to the meeting. The Treaty of Tordesillas drew a line down the Atlantic Ocean and said that Spain would have everything to the west of the line, Portugal would control everything to the east of the line, as long as they didn't interfere with currently Christian communities. So they couldn't interfere with France. They couldn't interfere with England. But indigenous people? No rights in this particular discussion. The original line is the thin line drawn here, 
1493. Portugal realized they kind of got cheesed in that particular drawing after a few uh, uh, expeditions, and the line was moved 400 miles to the west. What this little drawing, this little map represents in our modern world is the reason when you take your South American trip, your high school Spanish works everywhere but Brazil. Because that line crossed through that area and Brazil gained the western, excuse me, the eastern more, most portions of South America. Remember, they got everything on the east of the line. Spain got everything on the west. What does that really mean? Portugal is in control of the African continent and Brazil. And they single-handedly create the African slave trade, bringing slaves rounded up in Africa and brought into the New World through Brazil. That was their industry. Spain, on the other hand, begins to explore the rest of that land to find resources to export back to Spain to make their already magnificent kingdom even wealthier and even larger. By 1718, Spain had begun creating permanent settlements in the San Antonio River Valley. Missions in East Texas are absolutely struggling to survive. See, one thing about Spain's dog and pony show when they showed up somewhere is um, they tried a lot of different versions on how to get people on board. At the earliest times, you go back to Hernan Cortez and the Conquistadors, and it was by warfare, and it was by subjugation. And it was brutal in many, many, many instances. The name alone, I've talked about this many times. I've heard somewhere that the most beautiful world, word in any of our vocabularies is our own name, right? And we put our best foot forward when we introduce ourselves. I'm a, I'm a park ranger, a proud father of, you know, a daughter, this, that, things. We say what we want known about ourselves. These men weren't labeled conquistadors. They called themselves conquistadors. And if your Spanish isn't that strong, that word means conqueror. Why do we mince words when they did not? They are here to take over. I don't mean to make that any more ominous than it needs to be, but we need to be realistic about why Spain is here. Lipan Apache raids start becoming frequent. Understand that the people who had lived here for tens of thousands of years, they didn't always live peacefully. But new native groups being pushed farther and farther south by a series of colder and colder winters in the Midwest, pushing buffalo herds farther south, follow the food all the way here into South Texas. Hunter-gatherer bands are being forced to decide between becoming Spaniards or continuing their ancient way of life. Understand that the pressure put on by all these different groups of people moving into one area are gonna create these missions that we're gonna talk about. The very first mission built is Mission uh, San Antonio de Valero, what we call the Alamo now. I cropped the picture of our ever-present omnipotent image of the Alamo to make it look much what the original portion would have looked like. Beyond this, it actually would have looked considerably like Mission Concepcion when finished, although it was never completely finished. This mission was founded near the confluence of the San Antonio River and the San Pedro Springs. Spain moves into Texas and begins to legitimize that claim made back in 1494 that all of this land belonged to the crown and not encountering other Christian peoples, other than a brief run in with the French, which we won't even worry about. They had carte blanche to settle this land and make it what they would call Nueva España, New Spain. Two years later, Mission San Jose y San Miguel de Aguayo is established six miles south of Mission San Antonio and originally on the east bank of the San Antonio River. By 1732, it's relocated to the west bank. Think about our weather here in South Texas. You show up in year two of the beginning of the 10-year drought, 
and you think you've got the greatest land close to the river ever. And then nine years later, the jet stream changes, it moves north, low pressure takes over Texas, and every single tropical storm that enters the Gulf comes deep in, takes a right turn, and dumps 28 inches of rain on South Texas. All of a sudden, your perfect land you built your mission on is now knee deep in water. And that's likely what happened here with the first location of San Jose, till it's moved to the West Bank on higher ground where it still exists to this day. Mission Valero, by the way, has also moved once first from the west to the, or the east to the west as well. So there's a little bit of hit or miss finding that perfect piece of land to build your community on. This is the main south gate at Mission San Jose. Uh, it would have been a portal for Comino Real de los Tejas, right? The Royal Road of Texas, which would have extended from Mexico City all the way to Natchitoches, Louisiana and through each one of these missions. Uh, the very, very wonderful and talented Professor Frank de la Teja, Texas State University, uh, he and I have worked on a youth program about the Camino Real, uh, comparing it to the internet, that you could get information on the Camino Real, and you could get goods and services on the Camino Real, and you could spread viruses on the Camino Real, Pardon my Chewini in the background barking. We are working from home. Um, certainly, uh, there could be crime on the Camino Real just in the same way that there can be on the internet. So there are really similarities. I'll just say the download speeds now are much better than they were on the Camino. Um, here's uh, maybe the most iconic image that people are familiar with, Mission San Jose uh, Rosas window or the Rose window. A ton of legends associated with that window. Um, and later on in the presentation, we'll see likenesses of it uh, return. But it's been long said that a gentleman by the name of Pedro Wisar is the uh, sculptor of the window. Um, that's not provable. The Wisar family still lives right across the street from San Jose. I went to high school with Wisars. I would never uh, pick a fight with Mr. Wisar when he says that that's the case. But uh, in the old, I think everybody in the room here is old enough to remember Dragnet, you know, uh, Jack Webb, just the facts, ma'am, right? So when it comes to history, there's a little bit more than I need uh, the, to a legend. But we do know what the purpose of the Rose Window was. Neophytes who had not had First Communion did not go inside the church for service. They stayed outside and the priest would come off the altar and show the sacrament out the window and give them a little parable, a little uh, lesson uh, be the first kids in your block to be a full citizen and come inside with the rest of us. Uh, somebody called it the drive up window. I, I think that's kind of funny, but, um, and if they would have known that when the mission was rebuilt, that Pyron Avenue ran right beside it, it really was a drive in window for a number, a number of years. And of course, a, a beautiful view of the convent, two stories where the priest, where the priest and brothers would have lived and administered Mission San Jose. As Mitzi talked about earlier, long been considered the queen of the missions. And that's not a 20th century term. That's actually a colonial term that the friars who built this mission went so above and beyond the standard required minimum construction that even at the time people recognized this as being far above and beyond what anyone else had built out here on the frontier. In 1722, a mission that no longer exists is founded. Mission San Francisco Javier Najera, established between the two existing, between San Jose and Valero. Uh, it never progresses beyond temporary wooden structures. The inhabitants of this failed mission were folded into Mission San Antonio. Uh, the legend says that this native comes to Father Margiel and says, I have hundreds of followers, and the Spanish fall all over themselves to dedicate another mission for these people, and then when the reality of it comes, it's just a couple of dozen followers. They limp along for a number of years, and they realize that this big group isn't going to materialize. Uh, they're just included with one of the other missions. But interesting, the property, the land that was scouted for Mission Najera, would eventually be the land that becomes Mission Concepcion later, more or less. In 1731, 1731 is a pivotal year for San Antonio that not only are a number of missions relocated to the San Antonio River Valley, but the first Canary Island families are granted land on the west side of the San Antonio River across from Mission San Antonio. 
They create a civil community known as Via San Fernando. So this is the first Spanish civil community on the river valley. They would build their own church, which would later become San Fernando Cathedral. Of course, the old portion is over on the Flores side of the street. Canary Islanders are part African because the Canary Islands are off of Africa. And by caste level, they weren't exactly members in standing with Spaniards. So they had their own church and their own community. Uh, think of it as the Spanish probably very much thought of it as the wrong side of the tracks. No tracks yet, but you get the idea. Three missions, all originally established in East Texas, are transferred to the San Antonio River Valley. Now, as I was saying, the dog and pony show that Spain offers by the 1700s, there's no more conquistadores, right? There's no more forcing. They go into a community and they try and uh, convince them to participate by telling them all the great things they can do for them, all the things they can teach them, all the things they can uh, bring to their world. And one of those things that they're interested in bringing is agriculture. The problem with that in East Texas is those natives were better farmers than the Spanish were. Massive networks of, of agricultural trading communities stretching from present day Nacogdoches all the way to the Mississippi River uh, made what we call the Mississippian people, and in Texas, the Caddo, uh, remarkably wealthy natives. So where they were not hostile to the Spanish, there was nothing the Spanish could offer them to coerce them to become a part of that community. You know, it's, a, well, it's like they say, you know, uh, uh, air conditioners to Eskimos, right? Yeah, they, they had nothing to offer them that they needed. So the Caddo kind of politely said, sure, you can build your church here, but they didn't fall all over themselves to participate because again, there was nothing that Spain offered. Here in the River Valley, that's, that's a horse of a different color. 1731. Mitzi's favorite, right? Nuestra Señora de la Purísima Concepción de Acuña. It's established near the original site of that San Francisco Javier Nájara, the mission that failed on the east side of the river. I think one of the most iconic images of Mission Concepción is this charming, this is on the ceiling of one of the buildings in the, uh, one of the rooms in the convent. And it forever was known as the Eye of God so much candle wax and soot had gathered on the ceiling that only one of those eyes was visible for a very, very long time in some random color. Um, right around the time, I guess, Mitzi, that you were leaving, the restorers got in there and began to clean away the stuff and revealed this mustachioed sun on the ceiling who likely represents Philip V of Spain. Here's a story that I love to tell people in that room as they look up at this image. Your conscience can change the meaning of a sentence. Did you know that? So if I go to Colleen, and Colleen is an upstanding member of the society here, right? She helps uh, little old ladies and men across the street, and she volunteers three times. Just everybody's pillar of the community. And we're in this room with... King Philip and the sun and God and Spain didn't care if you confuse the image of King Philip and God. And if I said, Colleen, he's watching over you. Well, if you have a clear conscience, that's a very warm, comforting idea that someone is watching over you. Mitzi, I'm going to pick on you. Horse thief, right? You know, cheats on your tax. I'm kidding, of course. You know, criminal element that she is. I tell her, Mitzi, we're watching you. Oh, all of a sudden that sentence has a shockingly different meaning, doesn't it? Spain didn't care which meaning you took from this. You took the meaning from it that they thought your soul needed. If you needed a, a, a gentle hand on the shoulder, he's there. If you need a swift kick in the rear end, he's there as well. And he's always above you in this room. San Juan Capistrano lies just over three miles south of Mission San Jose on the east bank of the river. Uh, not the San Juan Capistrano they write the poems about. That's the swallows return to California, the scorpions return to South Texas, right? Nobody's going to write any poems about anything that returns to our San Juan, but it's a, a beautiful little site. Um, here's the interior of that tiny church. Uh, one of the most interesting things about San Juan today is its original acequia, its irrigation canal, has had water put back in it by the San Antonio River Authority about 10 years ago now. 
So we actually have the ability to grow crops on the San Juan land. And we began to do that under a partnership with the San Antonio Food Bank about four years ago. So for the first time in many, many years, you can come to San Juan and see crops in the field right outside the ruins of the mission. But maybe more importantly, those crops are going to help needy families here in San Antonio. In a strange sort of way, they're doing exactly what they were doing in 1750. And I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'll apologize in advance, and whatever microphone of my, the government's listening to me, it's the smartest thing I've ever seen the federal government do. And I've been here a long time, and that's kind of been, they've been few and far between sometimes, but this is a remarkable partnership where everyone gains. You know, early on, they talked about, we're going to grow crops. Well, as a federal agency, we can't sell them. What are we going to do? Well, let's let them die out in the field. Well, that would have been, that's, that's wasteful. That is just so remarkably wasteful. This partnership has really elevated uh, the mission in the community. Now, volunteers that had never been to the missions are out there and work the same fields that these natives worked hundreds of years ago. Last but not least in our change, San Francisco de la Spada was created an additional two miles south of San Juan on the west bank of the river. The reason I point out the east-west, east-west thing is when you draw it all out on a map, the missions create kind of a checkerboard on opposite sides of the river. They're acequias, they're irrigation canals. We'll talk about those in detail in a minute, but they don't overlap nor do the farm fields. If you put them all on the same side of the river and didn't want the fields and the water to overlap, the mission trail would be over 27 miles long. But now that they're condensed in this checkerboard pattern, the mission trail is only 12 miles long. Downtown near San Fernando Cathedral was the military fort, the Presidio. The reason to this day San Antonio still calls that area Plaza de Armas, military plaza. Mounted soldiers, if you're needed, if you need help for admission to Espada, the Comanche attack, you don't want your help more than 12 miles away. And 12 miles away, by the way, on horseback is still a long ways, half a day's ride. San Francisco de la Espada is the very end of the trail. It's the frontier of the frontier. It's personally one of my favorite churches. My office was at Mission Espada for a number of years. I got to know... Uh, the priest and brother, Franciscan brother, who at the time still lived on the property. Uh, um, wonderful guys. And brother Jerome is an absolute, uh, uh, I don't even know, character is, is, not, is not even a strong enough word for who brother Jerome is. I'll tell you a story, and he'll hate me for this, but probably. Um, he's administering uh, ashes on Ash Wednesday here at the church many, many years ago when I was there on site. And uh, course we get tourists from all over the world of all denominations the locals came through as people do on ash wednesday sometimes on their lunch break at work they would come by to receive the ashes or early in the morning or right after work uh, and this couple came up to him and, and they could never differentiate brothers and fathers they just see brother jerome in the brown robe and they get they say father uh we're not catholic but we're so moved by this can we receive the ashes? And Brother Jerome says, yes, my children, but not being Catholic, they won't stick. And that's just the kind of guy he was. I mean, you, just, you don't expect these guys to be funny, right? But they're hilarious. Some of them are absolutely hilarious. Um, it's a great big guy, six foot tall, kind of imposing, but just after you actually speak with it, that, all that just flies out the window. And he's absolutely, could have been a stand-up comedian in another life if he wanted to be. But uh, if you've ever been to a spot in the springtime and all the flowers are blooming, he's the caretaker of all of those flowers. Green thumb extraordinaire. The Asequias, between 1731 and 1745, nearly 50 miles of irrigation canals are dug by the natives to water the fields to feed these inhabitants. Understand, to make a group of people that typically moved every season stay in one place, to build a permanent community, meant that a large amount of food had to be created. The Asequias did what Mother Nature in South Texas doesn't do for us, and that's gave us a constant water supply where European crops and some American crops that simply had never grown in this area, the Ascente, corns, things like that, are within one season 
filling the fields around the missions. This is the true definition of feast, or in this case, famine to feast. People that literally did not know where their next meal was coming from within growing season not only had food, but had surplus for trade. Greatest get-rich scheme ever. Remember I said in East Texas, the natives didn't buy the Spanish sales pitch. The friars come and say, our God will provide for you with your trust and faith and labor. And after a season of growing, a real application of what these men said appeared in baskets. Sold American, well, sold Spanish in this case, right? What else does your God do for me? Well, stick around and let me tell you. That's how this conversion begins. Several Roman-style aqueducts were needed to bridge valleys and creeks and maintain the integrity of the Asequia level. So you had the little muddy creek, but you're, you want your water to stay up high so you have the gravity to let the water go downhill uh, 100 yards farther south. You build the stone bridge that carries the water. This is my favorite part of the park. It's a quiet corner. It's just so picturesque. And this is still... Now, where I said we put water back in the San Juan Acequia, the Espada Acequia is the oldest continuously running irrigation system in North America. This only ceased running when the Army Corps of Engineers changed the route of the San Antonio River and took the Espada Dam, the diversion dam, out of the flow all the little people that still create the Espada Ditch Company, the families that have frontage on the Asequia, brought their land-grant documents through multiple governments, United States, Republic, Republic of Mexico, Republic of Texas, Kingdom of Spain that said they had water rights. It never fully went to court, but let's just say King of Spain one, Army Corps of Engineers zero. Uh, and the water was put back in the ditch with a, uh, they didn't change the flow of their, their drainage, but they added an extra canal that brought water back into the Espada ditch. And it still flows to this day. And the family still vote a merodomo, a ditch master, every year. Actually, nobody votes him. It's kind of like Henry B. Gonzalez used to be way back when in South Texas. Uh, it's the same guy. It's Mr. Maspero, and his, he wants his son to take it, and his son didn't want any part. It's a long story. Anyhow, you know how that goes. So Henry B. Gonzalez was the congressman for San Antonio forever. Forever. And forever. He, I have a trivet from the U.S. Congress from Henry B. that we got as a wedding present. Somewhere. Tremendous. Now, here's something you may not know, Mitzi. His nephew, I went to school with his nephew from elementary school on, who at the time went by the name Jonathan Gonzalez, but now goes by the name Jonathan Joss. He became a, I don't want to say third, a lesser Hollywood actor. He appeared in that remake of The Magnificent Seven that came out a few years ago. He was in the remake of uh, True Grit. Uh, he did a mini series years, many, many years ago for Showtime about the West. But what he's probably known for best, he's the voice of the Native American character on that long running cartoon, King of the Hill. Uh, so that's his claim to fame, right? But he's uh, Henry de Gonzalez's nephew, and I went to school with him forever. So anyway. Well, and there's an Austin connection, because where does King of the Hill come from? But that's right. Yeah. Arlen, Texas is kind of sort of Temple, Texas, I think is what uh, Mike Judge said. Mike Judge being a former UT graduate and, and Austin alum himself. So yeah, it's great. Hey, we can do a whole section on cartoonists that went to UT, by the way. There's a ton of them. Anyway, this is another great view of the ground level of the aqueduct. So between that same time period of 1731 and 1745, mission ranches are created to tend European cattle first brought to this area by the Spanish. The beginning of the great American cattle trade in this part of the world comes from the first cattle drive by the Marquis de Aguayo, bringing tens of thousands of head of cattle up from Veracruz to seed these herds that would feed the mission inhabitants. 
Mission Cattle grew and did exponentially magnificent in this area to the point that the friars illicitly traded cattle with the French in Louisiana against Spanish rule uh, to get all the things they needed to maintain their missions. The vaquero is the, you know, that image. What is the great American image, right? It's the cowboy on a horse. Neither of those things are American. These first vaqueros are young Native American boys because it's a dirty, dangerous job, and they gave it to the lowest caste. Everything about the cowboy industry, the modern rodeo in Houston, chaps, chaparreras, lasso, the word rodeo itself, bandana, all of these things come from this originally Spanish industry brought to the new world by these people. Um, we had multiple ranches, Rancho de las Cabras, Atascoso, Monte Alban, provided this inhabitant, you know, the, these inhabitants food. Most of these vaqueros, in the true tradition of the word cowboy, were 12 to 15 years old. Come on, let's be in fairness. The funniest thing ever was 60-year-old John Wayne riding around calling himself a cowboy, right? By the time you hit about 25, you were way too old for that job. Um, they lived in these fortified communities dozens of miles from the missions. They'd bring in a, a dozen or so head of cattle every once in a while to be slaughtered for the mission inhabitants. The first brand registry in Texas, the Mesta, is a Spanish thing. So blame bureaucracy on Spain, right, in, in South Texas. A mid your job at the IRS began all these years ago with the Mesta in Spain. I, um, I wanted to share my, my grandfather um, it was an indigenous, the son of an indigenous woman, right? Mm -hmm. And where did they come from? From Atascosa County, right? He was a mm -hmm. cowboy mm -hmm. in Atascosa County, right? That's how his, once we get past his mother, mm -hmm. we can't find family records in the U.S. We have to go to Zacatecas mm -hmm. because we weren't, Amer you know, we were here always. First Texans. Right? Yeah. First Texans. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what did he do? He was a cowboy in Atascosa County. That's right. right? So, so to think that the link between 1731 and my son, right, mm -hmm. in, in this t time, mm -hmm. it's just a few lifetimes. It really, you know what? Uh, I'll, I'll go to a little bit of a rabbit hole here. My own great grandmother lived to be 102 years old and died in 1957. So she recalled seeing the newspaper that Lincoln had been shot. She was 10 when that happened. And that it really drives home that number one, she was crazy old, but number two, it was one very elderly person's lifespan away from my recollection of her words, right? To Lincoln's assassination. So, you know, in perspective, we think of these things as being ancient history. They're really not at all, right? So by 1745, the twin states, Coahuila and Texas, are firmly established, established as sovereign lands of Spain. I say this and I repeat this to the point of, of ad nauseum, and I think it sometimes is taken negatively, and I don't mean it that way at all. These beautiful missions, these beautiful churches, were not established about religion. This was creating a kingdom. What's so unique in our current world that we live in is that in Spain's eyes, there was no separation between this religion and this monarchy. As a matter of fact, they were one and the same. To be a citizen of Spain in this point in time, you legally had to be Catholic. So if they're going to create communities that make Spanish citizens that can be taxed and drafted into the army and all the wonderful things that a government will do, they had to make them Catholics. Now to the friars who come here, I don't think it's about politics at all. I believe these are largely men that felt they had a calling to do this work. And if you'll forgive the pun, a match made in heaven, you have a king that needs literate people that can teach not only the catechism, but vocational skills and all these things. And you've got a bunch of friars that want to be in the middle of nowhere where nobody's heard about God. It worked out perfectly, more or less, for both sides. So to say that the missions are not about religion is not true. To say that Spain's intent was to Christianize Texas, also not exactly true either. They're 
governments kind of don't work like that. I hate to say, but um, Spain was here to make it Spain. But what the people functionally did on the ground is what made South Texas. So we'll talk about the new arrivals. Um, I talked about the Apaches coming in kind of late. They're not an original native group to this area of Texas. They follow these buffalo herds farther and farther south. They're also a band community, but they had stolen horses from the Spanish. So now their hunting and gathering is greatly aided by the acquisition of horse and the ability to hunt better and carry more food meant that the bands got larger and larger and larger. Not excessively warlike, but more than willing to use their mobility advantage to their benefit. First, as with the Mostas, they could push these people off the prime hunting grounds along the river because they could get there in larger numbers and just bully them away, making life for the original bands here a nightmare. Our agents of the crown, Spanish soldiers, frontier cavalry, often referred to as salado de cuera for the long leather vests that they wore, that they were told would protect them from Indian arrows. It did not, did not. Arrow goes through and through that thing. It's just one more layer of hot in South Texas. And I dress up like this for school kids. I can say from firsthand, you're dealing with a cravat, a woolen shirt, a wool coat, and a multi-layer leather jacket, and that's South Texas, and that's not fun at all. Don't know how these men survived. Side note, when I say Spanish, understand it's a much more diverse term than you initially think. A significant number of these Spanish salados were Irish. They fled persecution of their Catholic religion to serve a Catholic king. Am I okay there? Okay, I think, can y'all hear me? Thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, good hearing, very good. Yeah, so yeah, so many, many of these Spanish men fled persecution of their Catholic religion to serve a Spanish king, or a, a Catholic king, I should say. Um, because of the caste system and not being Spaniards, they got the terrible details, which was riding around in leather armor in South Texas. But many, many of those families settled this area. There were also a good number of Belgians, too, that served out in this region. To say Spaniard in this time meant the kingdom. And if you were Catholic, you could be a Spaniard. You could be Spanish and denounce Catholicism and no longer be considered a Spaniard. Let that kind of sink in for a little bit, right? Um, and now, for some reason, oh, there we go. Uh, Franciscan friars. So the people that built the San Antonio missions and most of the missions in North America were of the Franciscan order. Jesuits had been expelled from the New World a little bit earlier during our mission time period. The followers of St. Francis, they pledged poverty, chastity, obedience. Two colleges training these men to do this missionary work in the New World. Zacatecas, previously mentioned, and Querétaro, both created Franciscan. They were already friars, but they taught them the vocational educational skills to become civil administrators. So men of God learning how to be missionaries in these colleges and then sent to the frontier. Last but not least, the Comanche. They're one of the last arrivals to the area. Another reason the Apaches show up here is because the Comanches were chasing them out of the plains. Lifelong enemies. Their creation myths say that they are in opposition. Uh, they're also a horse cultural hunters at war, really with anyone. Aggressively controlled more than half of the present day Texas until the late 1800s. If you drew a line from Fort Worth to Eagle Pass, the Comanches controlled everything to the north and west of that line until the U.S. Army finally did them in. But even they were afraid of them. They didn't take them on head on. They cornered them in Palo Duro Canyon up near Amarillo and killed their horses and starved them out of the canyon and then force them to live where no one should ever have to live, Oklahoma. I'm kidding, I'm just, that's a cheap shot, sorry. See if y'all are paying attention. But um, the Comanches are an amazing talk all to their own. Um, they're often portrayed as thieves, 
But when you learn about Comanche culture, you realize they're remarkably philanthropic. If we're all a Comanche band, and I'm looking at Mitzi's camera, and I say, that's an amazing bookshelf behind you. She'd have to give it to me because no one retains wealth. And she could look at mine and say, I love that piece of art that's on the wall. And I'd have to give it to her. Now, the way we accumulate those things is we classify all other living things as subhuman and we take the things from them. We already know that they were at war with the Apaches. And when the Apaches were afraid of the Comanches and tried to join with the Spanish, well, your enemy's friend is my enemy. And now the Spanish are in deep doo-doo. And later on, the Republic of Texas and Mexico, anybody that tried to cross them. A remarkable culture all to their own, but one more of these forces that, you know, if you think about a, a, a press or a squeeze, all these culture pressed together where there was water, the San Antonio River, and people just turned into this melting pot community because of all of these pressures. Spain brings with them a caste system. They're going to tell you who you should marry, who makes a good Spaniard, and who does not. These natives are going to join the mission, but they're never going to grow up to be king. There are going to be very specific rules about who can be married to whom and what that offspring's property rights are going to be. The Canary Islanders are always going to be on the outside of this, which leads to decades of bickering. Spain thought they would be in these missions for 10 years, and they wound up running in them for 100 the biggest problem Spain faces are epidemics because when you gather people together in large communities with the poor level of cleanliness that a European village brought, in other words, open chamber pots straight out the door into the community, you're going to have issues. Death rates always outpaced birth rates in spite of the fact that birth rates skyrocketed due to the diet, but it didn't matter. They struggled to maintain. Throughout the time period, Spain lost every war they participated in back in Europe. They're going financially bankrupt. Little by little, they begin to move away from this process because they simply can't afford it any longer. By the early 1800s, Spain is invaded by France, by Napoleon, putting his own brother, Joseph Bonaparte, as king of Spain. Little by little, South America sees Spain at its weakest and revolts one after another, Colombia, Bolivia. The revolution that will eventually create the Republic of Mexico in some ways is the wimpiest revolution ever from the respect that if you listen to what Mexico, what the people of New Spain wanted, and it may sound familiar if you know American history, they wanted equal representation at court in Spain. How can, a, how can a, a, a person in Spain know what we need here in Texas? Well, Spain's so bankrupt, they go, I got a better idea for you. You're on your own. Goodbye. And it becomes Republic of Mexico. That's obviously a major simplification of another talk we can have some other time about how we get the Republic of Mexico. But these friars didn't care who was in charge. They continued to run these churches even after it becomes Republic of Mexico. The holdout is Mission San Jose, which doesn't fully secularize until 1824, three years after the Republic of Mexico is founded. The communities had begun to drift away, but nobody went too far away from the acequia where the water was. As the walls crumbled, people took a handful of rocks and built their little hovel 200 yards out and still attended the same church. It's no longer a government commune, but a farming collective. Multiple migrations of other people, Germans, Bavarians, people from the East, move through the area and begin to add to that melting pot that becomes this region. But at its core, it's still Catholic Spanish. So what is the result of this work? Let's talk commercialism. Remember I said we were going to revisit the rose window? Well, that particular rose window is on the old Joskies department store downtown known as River Center Mall. You'll find replicas of the Rose Window all around San Antonio, even including uh, highway abutments and all kinds of things. Everything around here is called Mission, right? Mission Chevrolet, Mission Baseball, Mission Tortilla. You know, it, it's, uh, there's a golf course named Mission Del Lago, 
not too far from the missions themselves. And people all the time ask about the sixth mission, Mission Del Lago. So, no, 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 you don't want to go down there. Not if, unless you've got a good game and you can play the ball left or right, you don't want to go to Mission Del Lago. But the real legacy is going to be people. I don't have a date for this photo, but my guess is going to be about 19, World War I in front of Mission Espada. Remarkable image. Some very kind of 1920s dress. These kids in the back row could have been neophyte natives in 1744. It's, I don't know if it's a, if it's a pageant that they're doing. I, I really don't have an explanation. It's just a really remarkable image. How about the school at Mission Espada? This is circa 1943, during World War II. The Catholic nuns, the sisters uh, uh, from Incarnate Word, which, you know, later Incarnate Word University. You see, uh, guy, they're my girls. There you go. There you go. They ran the school at Espada until 1967. And the only reason they quit then is the modern free independent Southside independent school district was built. And whereas the poor families may have preferred their children to get a Catholic education, free was still freer than cheap. So they went to the free public schools. But these nuns, being the enterprising women they were, applied for one of President Johnson's very first Head Start grants and opened the daycare that ran behind Mission Espada until 2006. I was going to say that um, it was not the first federal partnership we had Head Start, right? That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And this is another great image of the nuns taking the kids out to the, the, the playing fields around this spa. The, the ruins in the background are the ruins of the Spanish mission walls, the native quarters that would have housed probably some of these children's great great grandparents for years. What is that legacy? A national park, a place where people can come. And how about in 2015, a world heritage site included, it, it blows me away that I work at a place that's on the same list with the Parthenon and the pyramids of Egypt, but it was declared that there is nowhere else, even in Spain, where there's this collection of these colonial structures that still have the irrigation, the fields, the missions, the homes, all in one place. So right here in our own backyards, we have this amazing uh, uh, educational, uh, inspirational, functional facility. Understand that all four of these churches are in fact still active parishes with service every Saturday night and every Sunday. Um, one of the most unique elements of the creation of the National Park was that no dollar fee would ever be taken to get you into the park in fear that it would stop people from attending the churches. They also promised to give us a bump in the budget. That never really worked either, but we'll talk about that some other time. <laughs> but the reality of it is, it, it's a remarkable partnership. Do we always get along? Heck no. Anybody in here that has a partnership that's called like a marriage or whatever, and you sit here and you tell me you always get along, we're just going to mute your microphone because we don't like liar. No, I'm kidding. I mean, you know, there's days when they want to have the big bake sale out in front of the church and you, know, you can't sell stuff on federal property. And there's days we've got a busload of visitors from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and there's a funeral and the church is closed to us. But what we tell those people is you rarely get to see something this age still being used exactly the way it was the day it was built and not for show for the functionality of ministering to a community and having weddings somewhere let's see i've got to find my aunt must have the picture of my cousin's wedding in front of san jose about 1973 and we looked like the the Brady Bunch and these ugly baby blue tuxedos all in front of missions. You know, it's very 1974. It was pretty horrible, but um, so, so I'll leave you with this story. Um, I had been in the park about five years when the park historian said, let's ask the community for their old photos of the missions. Let's create a collection we call faces of the missions. Okay. And I brought that very picture in and people brought in their pictures from the fifties and 40s and 30s and 20s and teens. And finally, this little old lady comes in 
and they're wheeler in a wheelchair and she weighs 85 pounds or she weighs an ounce. No, no English, you know, has a little cigar box on her uh, lap and tells us in Spanish, you can look at these, but you can't have them. It's like, Oh no, no. We tell her, we don't want them. We just want to take a picture of them. She goes, okay. Now, honestly, this woman's a hundred if she was a day old and she opens up the little box and hands the park historian Roslyn Rock, the late Roslyn Rock, a little photo and, you know, little tiny one because the photos in that day were like three inches by three inches and says, this is my grandmother's first communion in 1884. Mm-hmm. And we just all just, you know, stop, you know, and look at this rem- You know, the photo was barely visible at this point in time, but just there's a living person that has a memory. So if her grandmother, 1884, right? Then great grandmother is 1830s or 40s, right? Great, great grandmother is the very end of the mission period. The oldest photo we got was not usable, but it was actually 1866. And there's some question it might have been the very first Kodak camera in our area. My granddad so, was born in 1884. Yeah. So, my, my last name's Castaños. My grandfather was born in the Philippines as a Spaniard because he lived to be over 100 and died in the early 1980s. So he lived through the Spanish-American War and joined the United States Navy to come here and settled in South Texas amongst people who he understood perfectly, being a secondhand Catholic and secondhand Spaniard the way these people started. <laughs> And it was nice and warm, just like it was the Philippines. He started in Chicago. He hated Chicago. Chicago way too cold for a Filipino. He hated Chicago. But South Texas, A-OK. Million degrees, thousand percent humidity. Secondhand Spanish, you know, Spanish speakers. He was perfectly at home here in South Texas. Um, that legacy of Spain stretched worldwide. But the legacy that they accidentally created here is the American Southwest that we know to this day. And so I would end my tours of the mission and I would say so so people would always ask where did these people go they didn't go (laughs) we are anywhere here Here we we are are. and 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 shockingly one of the park rangers that we had for a number of years who had a, a, a the most direct lineage could trace a great, 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 great grandmother to actual marriage records at Mission Espada. His name was Glenn Clark. You know, and that it talks about the way that these communities morphed with these very, these new populations mm-hmm. of people that moved into the area. He didn't have this fantastic, I'm Don Francisco Viega. No, Glenn Clark. But Glenn Clark could trace his lineage all the way back. Um, we've got a gentleman by the name of Mickey Killian. I don't know if you ever knew the Killians, Mitzi, but... Um, this is the descendant of these Irish immigrants and these Native Americans. His is a native. When he did his 21 and me, he came up, bing, 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 way Native American. More than people that had these very traditional kind of names before that. So don't let a name or an appearance confuse you. These families have been in these communities forever. But deep on the south side of Spada Road, occasionally there'll be a little boy that'll come up and you look at him and he speaks to you in Spanish and he's got some green eyes and red hair and you go the Spaniards. I mean, there's little traces of where these people came from. And it's just such a, a wonderful treat to see how these people blended and created this remarkable community that we, we still live and work through and take for granted, like we always do. Right. And that's one of the things about San Antonio. It's always been a place where cultures combine right, from the headwaters of the San Antonio River, where all these indigenous groups gathered to trade, right? Um, they would, the, the people would come up from the coast to, with tar balls, and they would trade tar balls, mm-hmm. right? And always, San Antonio has been very cosmopolitan, very multicultural. Kind of the way most port cities are. You know, port cities are remarkable. You in New Orleans, you talk about uh, uh, Savannah, places like that, because of that influx of trade goods from all around the world. You know, a, a, an accent, a Cajun accent, a Louisiana Southern accent, and the New Orleans accent, completely different animals. 
because of that constant influx of different groups of humanity that came through New Orleans in a remarkable way. San Antonio has that similar thing, but it was because of the river at that time. Everyone congregated at the river because you're in South Texas. You kind of run out of water really fast around here. Go west. Try that out. There's no water. Right. I'd, any questions? I'll be happy to answer anything that anybody has. Uh, Observations? Uh, considerations? Yes, no. This has been fun. Oh, Tom, thank you for taking me home. Well, my pleasure. In our strange year where we talk in little boxes on laptops, right? You know. But, you know, we still talk. And That's right. That's the important still, part, right? Right. We still That's gather. The part. Um, and thank you for allowing us to record this. I forgot sure. to push the record button at the very beginning. But um, of your enthusiasm. Thank you so much. Um, it, missions to start a, a, I would probably, okay, I'll, allow me, everything that I'm about to say is during normal times. I would start at Mission San Jose, where our main visitor center is. You can normally see our film, which is a lovely little 20 minute film we were going to show today, but we have lots of issues right now. Get the literature, the map, all of that kind of thing. Um, the park is open right now. But none of the facilities, none of the ranger stations or anything like that are at this time. Um, we're hoping to, we were hoping to start reopening. Now, unfortunately, it looks like things are, and you guys are having it worse than we are right now, but we kind of assume that any day now it's going to be here as well. So I, I don't even know what to tell people anymore. Come on down, you know, wear a mask, walk around. Who knows what you're going to see? Uh, the parishes are opening the churches themselves. So San Jose gets opened very regularly, the church, but the smaller parishes, which typically depend on some deacon who may not even live in the community to open them, don't get opened as regularly. So definitely probably still start at San Jose. And uh, I hope you have the opportunity to see these places open and hopefully soon we'll be beyond all this mess and things will be kind of normalish. But for the time well, being, it's, it's nice a weird to, world. It's nice to have a Zoom meeting, you know, to you know to hear your knowledge about it and just thank you it with such enthusiasm and oh it's fun you know if, if it ain't fun don't do it <laughs> right i did other career fields i used to threaten my boss i've done other things i'll do something else i'm not going to change anymore but um thank you no the reality of it is this is a fun story for me um it could have been boring if i just read the brochure and repeated the same thing for 20 years but as someone with a background in anthropology and an interest in history, I dug deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And um, there's always something new to find out. Always something new. I'm never a dull moment. And I work primarily with school kids, which either keep you young or send you an early grave. I'm not sure which it is yet. I'll let you know any day now. But and maybe thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. And maybe if there's good. interest. And we'd like to get a group together when this is over, when we cross to the other side. <laughs> You'll have your very own tour leader talking to you along the way, and then we'll let the professionals take over. Sounds like mm -hmm. a plan. Be happy and to have if, you guys. If, ask San Antonio, right? He's the miracle maker. Ask San Antonio to see if we can get a copy of that video, because if we do, Tom will share it with us. Yes. And I can share it with you and friends. You can tell a friend and this will go viral. So we thank you, Tom, so much. My pleasure. I, My pleasure. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. You're great. Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Come again. Thank you. Thank you.